Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to today's program, The Social History of New Jersey Asylums. My name is Regina Fitzpatrick. Uh, I am one of the reference librarians at the State Library, and I'm going to be in the background uh, giving technical support during the webinar. Uh, today's presenter is going to be Caitlin Cook, and we are delighted to have her. I just have a couple of housekeeping announcements before we begin. Thank you. Um, if you do have any questions, we are going to answer them at the end of today's webinar. However, you can submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar in the Q&A or the chat uh, feature, which you should see at the bottom of your Zoom dashboard. Uh, we do have a survey following the program. The survey helps us develop future programming and uh, we really value your input. So if you could please fill that out for us, that will be absolutely wonderful. Uh, we have some digital information about New Jersey asylums in our state records collections, and you can see the links below. I am going to uh, post these two links in chat once we get started on the presentation. And then finally, I just want to quickly go over what you should be seeing in your Zoom dashboard. So in the bottom center, you should see three little buttons. The first one on the left is the chat button uh, where you can interact with um, the other audience members, interact uh, with me directly, um, or you can post questions there. On the right, you'll see a Q&A button where you can submit uh, questions. Um, and like I said, we will be answering those at the end of the program. And then finally, um, if you do need assistance, the middle icon, the raise hand, please use that and I will privately message you and see how I can help. Uh, finally, I do want to warn you um, that our presentation today is going to go right up until 1 p.m. Uh, Caitlin has tons of information for you. She's very excited to share. Um, so our Q&A is going to start at one. However, if you need, if you do need to uh, drop off early, fear not, because we are recording today's presentation. So you will be able to go back and watch whatever you missed. And with that, I will turn things over to Caitlin. Um, and also, Regina, before we get started, I did get a message from a, a, a viewer that the chat appears to be disabled. Yes, that happens sometimes, and I'm going to fix that right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Cook, and I am a New Jersey government document librarian and also a digital librarian here at the State Library. Um, and so part of my job is to go through our state document collection, um, particularly our historic collections, look for materials that are of interest to the public and researchers, digitize those and make those available freely online uh, for the public. Um, and in doing that over the years, I've found many interesting collections, but in particular, I found this collection of reports about the 19th century asylums uh, in the state. And I've worked with a lot of researchers over the years on these. And one of the things that I found um, that most often happens is researchers come into looking at these collections expecting to see uh, a, a report written in a certain kind of way or a certain kind of data. And they're almost always surprised by how much detail is in these reports and also how much of a, a glimpse into patient life is actually available through these reports. Um, and I think part of that surprise comes from because when we think about asylums, we tend to think about abandoned spaces maybe even haunted spaces. Uh, we have a, it's part of the social consciousness, I think, to think of, of these places in, in a more Halloween horror context as, as places of, of torture and anguish. Um, I am not going to downplay patient experiences. 
um, in the course of this talk. But what I do want to do is introduce you to, to some of the things that we find in these reports, some of the images and the data that you can see from when the asylums were active, when they were actually homes for patients and staff, when they had elements of community and social lives like sports teams and theatrical productions, where they had communal spaces like bowling alleys, um, billiard halls, patient libraries, patient museums, even a, a very large on-site chapel. And so today we're gonna look at two collections in particular that are here at the State Library. We do have a number of reports from other uh, state hospitals and state asylums, um, but they are, are not very complete collections. Our two most complete collections are the annual reports of what was then called the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum at Trenton, which would later become the New Jersey State Hospital at Trenton, and also the annual reports of the State Asylum for the Insane at Morristown, which would change names a couple of times. It would become the New Jersey State Hospital at Morris Plains, and then it would become the New Jersey State Hospital at Greystone Park. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with the hospital at Greystone Park, that is a totally new facility. It is not the same facility um, that we're gonna look at today, but it is on the same grounds. Um, and I have provided some links there to directly to those collections, but I will also bring this, these back up again at the end of the talk. Um, but before we really get started, um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to go into um, and offer a couple of words of caution. Um, first of all, there is terminology used in these reports. Um, I'm going to try to use it very sparingly, if at all. Um, if I do use any of these terms, it will be in the context of the reports, but the terminology that you will see in these reports um, would not be considered in any way appropriate today. Um, at the time, they were considered sometimes diagnostic terms, um, and you can actually find uh, medical textbooks from that time period that will define the diagnostic uh, criteria for each of these terms, but they are terms that are not in use today. Um, the second thing that I would like to bring up is that there will be some topics about patient condition and treatment discussed that may be difficult to hear, um, particularly towards the end of this talk. And so I will, I will give an additional warning when we get to that, that piece. Um, but I really want to make sure that when we look at these reports, we are keeping in mind that these were real people. Um, these are real people living lives with conditions and in situations that were beyond their control. Um, and the reports themselves do anonymize patients, but they also do tend to dehumanize patients. Um, so um, I just want to keep that human perspective in mind where possible and not dehumanize these patients even further. Another thing to keep in mind is that all of the reports are written from the point of view of the administration. Okay, so we don't find a patient's perspective in these reports. We don't find a patient's family's report, uh, perspective. We don't even find a community perspective in these reports. We are finding exclusively what the administration thought was important to share with the governor and the legislature. And that point of view really matters because it is very one-sided. And so what I do always encourage researchers who use this collection to do is to look for supportive resources, things that are um, outside of the reports that give a little bit more information. And so what we see on this slide is just, these are three examples of articles I found in the Trenton Times. And the reason I chose them was just because these bits don't appear in the reports for the corresponding year. Um, so the first one on the left there is actually a, a nice one. It's, an, it's talking about how a play was put on for the patients um, where all the attendants played the parts. And it actually lists all the names of the attendants and what part they played. Um, the middle one there is less great. Um, this one talks about, a, a, unfortunately, a patient was beaten to death by two attendants. Um, it gets the briefest of mentions in the report. The newspapers, however, covered the case much more exclusively and you can see what happened and also what happened to the attendants. In this case, they did go to prison for their, for their crime. On the, on the right there, 
This was uh, unfortunately about uh, a patient suicide. In the report, the only mention of it is a number on a statistical table. You get no other information. When you read the newspaper coverage, you see how um, attendant neglect really did play a role in this um, and how it affected the community. So these kinds of resources, I think, are essential for getting a more full picture uh, of what was going on in the asylums and how life was, was going by. Um, to kind of give a, a little bit of context for why these asylums were developed and why where they came from, I want to give you the very briefest uh, amount of history just to, to bring up a little bit of context. Um, so prior to the building of asylums like this, treatment and care of persons with intellectual disabilities um, and mental illness um, varied tremendously, um, both in the US and in Europe. Um, for many, uh, these kinds of characteristics, these kinds of issues were um, signs of a punishment, some kind of divine punishment, perhaps. Um, a person could be incarcerated, they could be abandoned. Abuse was very common. In some cases, it was even encouraged. Um, uh, one figure who, who came out to try to speak against that type of treatment was a man named Philip Pinnell, who advocated for what he called moral management. Um, he suggested that mental illness might be more of a disease needing treatment than some kind of punishment. And he encouraged caring for people rather than trying to abuse and punish them. Uh, the Society of Friends, who many know as the Quakers, um, really took this to, to heart and founded a place called the York Retreat in, in the UK in 1796. And this was to be in direct contrast to one of the more notorious um, abusive prisons um, called York Asylum at the time, where um, almost torturous treatment was, was given to persons suffering. Um, the York Retreat, on the other side, was designed to be just that. It was designed to be a place where someone could come, rest, recover, um, be safe from abuse, and have the time they needed to, to, to help themselves and be cared for. This type of an effort was followed in the US with the building of the New York State Lunatic Asylum in Utica in 1843, it followed the same type of model um, where care for patients was being advocated. One of the more prominent figures to, to push this movement in the US was Dorothea Dix. And some may already know Dorothea Dix in the context of nursing. Um, she was the head of the, the Army Nurse Corps during the Civil War, but she was known throughout her life as a patient advocate. Um, she had suffered from some mental health conditions during her youth and had taken a trip to Europe to rest and recover. And while she was there, she was introduced to that Quaker style of treatment. This, this treatment style really galvanized her. Um, she began touring prisons and poorhouses throughout the UK and the US. She was looking for how people were being cared for if they weren't privileged enough to take elaborate vacations to, to, to find some care. She started documenting in detail the care for the mentally ill that she was finding. Um, and then she would begin addressing legislatures with that detail. Um, when she came to New Jersey, she had learned that New Jersey had put up some efforts to try and build an asylum, but they were all defeated in the legislature and it all went by the wayside for several years. So she came to, the, she came to New Jersey, she toured each and every facility that she could find. Um, and when I say facility, I do mean that very, very loosely because the, the style of care at the time was if someone was suffering from these, one of these conditions and they could not care for themselves, the state would pay private citizens to just take that person in without any kind of restriction, without any kind of expectation. So abuse was rampant. Um, people could be chained up in basements, um, ch locked up in horse stalls, um, chained in small rooms, wherever. Um, abuse was quite rampant. And so she typed up what she called a memorial to the legislature. And we actually have a copy of this. We've digitized it. The link is there that you're, you're able to view it if you'd like. Um, but this, this, this memorial to the legislature 
went place by place and listed all of the, the sufferings that she found and pointed out the great shame that this made for uh, the state's image. In particular, she found a retired politician who many of the, the legislators had known who was now advanced in age, um, suffering from dementia and the subject of, of one of these abusive conditions. Um, with this reporting, the legislature was spurred to act. And within a few years, they had constructed the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum at Trenton. So this opened up in 1848. And um, much like Utica, it followed um, what was called the, the Kirkbride model of architecture. Um, the Kirkbride model uh, considered the design of the space to be a part of the restorative process for, for patients. It emphasized natural light. Uh, it emphasized fresh air. Um, it, it emphasized having large ornamental and at least or at least upkept grounds where patients could walk. Um, that would be aesthetically pleasing. That would be mentally stimulating. Um, it advocated even you know having colors, fabrics, art on the walls. Um, it was designed with a, a, a total care in mind as a place for a patient to both physically and mentally rest um, and recover. Um, so the, the facility when it opened did also include a very large working farm that would help supply materials to, uh, to the, the, the residents, but also provide some opportunity for occupational labor. The first superintendent of the, the facility was a man named Horace Buttoff. He had been the superintendent at Utica and he was known to Dorothea Dix. They had a very similar mindset when it came to patient care. Um, he emphasized um, that the staff should work with moral management. They should work with empathy. They should see their patients as human beings in need of care. He emphasized that sleep, nutrition, physical exercise, and mental stimulation were all essential for recovery. Um, and what was particularly radical for the time period was he also advocated for um, patient privacy and um, civil rights. He felt very strongly that no one should come to the, come to the facility um, without some measure of understanding what was going on, um, without some say in the process. Um, and they also advocated that people should not come in and um, ever look at patients in, as, a, as a curiosity, which was something that was done at the time in other places. His reports, um, which are really were pretty interesting, contain just philosophical essays um, where he talks at length about um, how he saw the, the, the causes of insanity in his terms, um, treatments, cares, cures, things that he wanted to see happen for these patients. So on the one hand, he was incredibly progressive. Um, he really did see overall health as a part of improving mental health. He wanted to see quiet, stable routines. He also wanted to build up a lot of goodwill with the community. Um, but on the other hand, he was a product of his time. Um, and you do see that in the reports. He had a very paternal style of management, which could be good or bad. Um, he had a very strong religious point of view. Um, so you can even see he, he talks at length about how having too little faith or too much faith um, or too little or too much fear of God could be a sign of derangement. Um, he looks at heredity as being a major factor um, in, to the point where he, he talks at length about if you have family histories of mental illness, you should do everything you can to not pass on to children. So he was very much a product of his time, even though he was a progressive individual. Um, and in his reports, you can get a real glimpse of the, the demographic of the facility. Um, so in the top there, you can see that there were young children um, there, as well as senior citizens. Um, you can see laborers, housewives, um, both blue and white collar workers. Um, and you can also see how he's laid out different 
causes. Uh, and again, this is this really shows you that that product of the time where you can see if you look on the list to the bottom right, um, you can see Mormonism is actually listed there as a, a cause of insanity, um, along with religious excitement. Um, so in, regarding the Mormonism, do bear in mind, this was a, a time when the, the Mormon faith was only um, recently emerged, relatively recently emerged. Um, and um, for people like Butoff, um, participation in that or faith in that um, was outside of the norm. Um, so there is something to, to just keep in mind when you look at this. Um, but regardless, he was responsible for building up the institution. Um, this photo here shows um, the schematic after the first expansion um, that he was able to successfully advocate for. Um, you see the facility opened and was completely at capacity within its first three years and was over capacity very shortly after that. And it would actually remain in a state of over capacity for its entire duration, despite many um, expansions. It was usually just a matter of by how many people they were over capacity from year to year. Um, but Budoff was able to successfully get the, the buildings expanded um, a few times. Um, uh, and what's nice about it, each time he's advocating for these expansions, he really goes into detail about what was available in the building, what was there, and what was so insufficient. Um, usually it's just a brief description of the building and the facilities, but there is one report in particular. Um, this one is from 1858, where they actually went room by room and listed every single thing that is available in the room. So you can really get a very, very detailed look at what was available, what was in place. I don't know of any other resource that will give you this kind of detail and this kind of a glimpse. Uh, and his reports are also filled with um, excitement. Every time there's a new piece of technology or a new major expansion, um, he goes into great detail talking about all of these new technological advances. So here you see a photo of when they had a brand new ventilation system built to keep fresh air pumping through the building. Um, he, he talks at length about how, how wonderful this was and how uh, a great invention it was. But it's by far, it's not the only one by any means. Um, he talks about when they switched from candles to gas lighting. Um, every time they got new heating and plumbing systems, new washrooms, uh, new washing machines. And then my, my personal favorite, he talks about when they uh, installed an aerated bread maker, which I'd never heard of before I read these reports. Um, but this was a time period when germs had only recently been discovered. And so there was a little concern about using yeast in bread um, and whether or not that would contribute to patient sickness. So um, the aerated bread maker would actually pump carbon dioxide directly into a dough rather than using yeast and then um, be baked from there. And he talks about this exciting technology and how the inventor um, allowed them to use it without having to pay any license fees. So, um, there are some really neat little pieces of, of 19th century technology in here. Um, but there was also a, a lot of activity available for patients. Um, there was a large chapel built that had, a you can see here, a very large organ um, designed for, for every weekend. Um, and uh, they would also bring in local pastors on a rotating basis to give services. There were both patient and attendant bands, theatrical performance, both per performed by patients um, and also brought in to entertain patients. Um, there were both baseball and football teams, um, bowling alleys, billiard halls, extensive grounds for walking. For some, there was um, continuing their schooling. Um, there was a large patient library with a lot of books donated from the community, uh, arts, crafts. There's also there's a lot of conversation about competing, competitive gardening um, competitions between patients. Um, and that's partly because farm and occupational labor was a big part of this. Um, it was part of their recovery, according to Butoff. So patients would be on the farm or in a tin shop um, sewing. Uh, making rugs, making furniture, um, any number of activities. 
And Butoff did build up a lot of goodwill with the community. Almost every report has a listing at the end of people who had donated either money or uh, materials to uh, the, the patients. Um, Dorothea Dix in particular is listed as donating every single year up until her death. Um, and that's actually um, an interesting piece because she spent the last five years of her life actually living at the hospital in a little apartment um, before she was uh, before she passed and was was um, returned to Massachusetts to her family graveyard. But um, these donations really give you a glimpse of what the community felt. They were donating any number of things from books and artwork um, to whole buildings, um, greenhouses, ornamental fountains, um, a kaleidoscope, mu moving pictures, different things for, for patient entertainment. Um, and like I said, some whole buildings were donated. So this was um, a, a, an open floor calisthenium, so an open floor gym for female patients um, where they could hold, have exercise, they could hold dances, and this was a, a, a small reading museum and museum exclusively for the patients that was built on the grounds along the walking paths. Um, the idea was that patients who were out for a walk could stop partway there, sit down, read, look at objects in the museum, um, have some mental stimulation before continuing on their walk. Um, but as I did mention, the, the, the facility was overcrowded very, very quickly. And um, after several rounds of expansions, but off it convinced the legislature that a second facility was really necessary. So a, a second facility was built uh, in Morristown. It opened in 1876 and it was built on the, uh, the Trenton Asylum model, had the same, um, same layout, same concept. Um, Butoff himself transferred over to serve as its first superintendent, and he brought with him about 350 of their longer-term patients um, to come and start the new facility. But it, too, would be completely overcrowded within five years, and that overcrowding would remain an issue for its entire duration. Um, but this is the time period where we really see things start to change um, at both of the both of the facilities. Over on Trenton, um, John Ward, who had been the assistant physician, takes over. He will stay until 1907. And I point that year out in particular because that was a particularly um, tumultuous year I'll, that I'll talk about in a bit, little bit. Um, but what's good about the John Ward years was he the, the reports do start to change and they provide a lot more statistics on patient makeup and heredity. You find out more about the conditions, you find out more about what's being produced in the farm in uh, extreme detail, what's being grown, what's being um, made in the various shops, how much they, they were selling those things for. Um, you also start to get a lot more information on new treatments and more drug use and more drug experimentation um, and the results of those. You also see the arrival of um, what they call convict patients. So these were patients transferred from the state prison. Um, this would be at both Trenton and Morristown and every director from this point forward will complain about this imposition from the state um, that the facilities were not built to be a prison. They were not secure. Um, they did not feel that they were capable of, of providing adequate care for patients coming over with criminal behaviors and backgrounds. Um, and they also did not feel it was fair to um, bring people with criminal behaviors in among patients um, who had did not have those, especially in a facility that housed everyone from young children through um, senior citizens. Um, at Morristown, um, you see a major um, farmland extension to the property. And this would actually sour uh, Buttoff's reputation with the legislature. He approved it without their permission. Um, and it would kind of put him on their list for a little while. Um, but you do see um, more treatments being explored and you actually see visiting hours for family members being reduced. Um, so you do see a lot of, of changes in how things are proceeding in both places. And then we start to get the major scandals. Um, at Morristown, Butoff would be forced to resign. Um, what happened was there was a typhoid outbreak 
in the local town. It was blamed on the asylum. Um, but off approves a new sewer design to try to eliminate the, the, the cause of concern, um, but he actually makes it much, much worse. Um, so he will be forced to resign. Um, the state will also step in at this point and separate responsibilities so that one person is no longer responsible for all aspects of the asylum. From now on forward, they'll have a medical director and responsible for the patients and a superintendent responsible for the grounds and facilities. Um, this would end up being something they come to regret, which I will go into in a sec. Um, but one of the new um, medical directors will very proudly point out that under their leadership, they could end the non-restraint craze. He actually goes on to talk about how only extremists practice non-restraint and that restraints are necessary for patient care. So that's a major change that we see. Um, we see a lot more drug trials and experimentations, and the reports start to include a lot more autopsy information as, as the medical directors began searching for causes of insanity in their terms. Um, but one of the big signs of trouble is that successive medical directors will resign, um, and eventually it will come to the notice of the, the legislature they will send in um, an investigative team and find that things are in a terrible, terrible state. Um, the superintendent, uh, Monroe, will be found to have uh, practiced gross negligence as well as fraud. He was pocketing a lot of the money um, that the state was sending. Um, he was only upkeeping the pieces of the grounds and buildings that the uh, investigators would come through and letting everything else kind of go to rot. Um, it, it, he builds an extravagant horse barn with apartments on top, but lets everything else fall apart. Like when the managers off, like actually go and um, wander off on their own and look at the grounds for themselves, they realize that, for example, all of the, the, the hogs had died of disease and they had to actually burn the, the barn that they had been living in because it was just in such a, a terrible contagious state. So Monroe will be forced to resign um, new rules are brought into place. The management is put back under one person um, and they try to really get this back to the way it had been. And um, we do find in the, the 1907 report that it, it actually is reported as having gotten back on track. Um, everything has been repaired. Everything has been replaced. Um, patient care is back to, to the way it had been. Um, uh, but it went through a very rough period right there. Trenton is um, doing no better by any means. So um, we, we start to see some problems um, in the newspapers where there are public accusations about poor food quality for the patients. And you can actually find in the Trenton Times um, what I would consider to be a bit of a fluff piece where a reporter supposedly shows up unannounced uh, for a surprise visit to see for himself and um, is shown um, very good quality food and that everything is is fine. Um, but this 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 initial scandal is in the public mindset when there is a typhoid outbreak here as well. It spreads into the local town. It is it is found to be the, the asylum is the source. Um, so the Department of Health steps in um, and starts investigating. And during the process of investigations, they start finding more and more problems. Um, the biggest one being that Ward had actually covered up a murder. Um, the, uh, a, a patient had been murdered by a pair of attendants. Um, Ward wrote it up that the patient died probably of syphilis, let the, the attendants go, um, didn't report anything. Um, but this all unco gets uncovered and becomes a major scandal. It's in the papers um, regularly until everything is, is kind of covered, uh, investigated more fully by the state. Um, the state comes in with an investigative committee. Um, we actually have a copy of that committee report. I put a link there for you if you'd like to read it, but the committee actually finds things are worse than alleged. Um, they find that everything is in a state of disrepair. Um, the food is as terrible as it had been reported. Um, there's a lot of what they call ne neglect and non-management. Um, this results in major changes, not only for the organization, um, a lot of people are fired, um, replaced, restructured. 
um, but also legislative changes because this is such a major scandal that from this point forward, new laws go into a place to protect patients. Um, and for example, one thing is that from this point forward, the hospital can no longer just bury a body. Now it has to be reviewed um, by a coroner, by a, uh, someone outside of the community. There has to be some oversight. Um, they're no longer quite trusted. Um, so this is a, a major time of change for the, for the, for the asylum. Um, for, uh, I'm gonna say, unfortunately for the hospital, this is also the time when um, a new director is brought in to replace John Ward. Um, and this director is Henry Cotton. Um, Henry Cotton would unfortunately become probably the, the asylum's most, well, at this point, um, it's no longer called an asylum. At this point, they had returned it to be a hospital. So I'll, I'll use that term from here forward. But um, Henry Cotton steps in and becomes the most notorious um, medical director of uh, the hospital's life. He um, felt very strongly that previous types of care was inappropriate that um, mental illness was not so much a product of heredity, but rather was the product of some type of infection. Um, he felt very strongly that if he could find the source of a patient's infection and remove it, he could cure their insanity. Um, so uh, I did mention early on that this is the part where um, this might be difficult to hear regarding patient care. Um, if you uh, would prefer to step out for a bit, I would totally understand, but um, I will talk a little bit about Henry Cotton and I will be brief about his because I don't wanna to discuss too much detail in this forum, but um, you can read more detail in his reports if you're, if you're interested, but he would in particular be known for removing patient teeth. Um, he found that a, a, a lot of patients came to him with um, tooth infections, abscesses, infections in the jaw, um, infected tonsils. Um, so he really focused on removing them in an effort to provide care. Um, he was also interested in particularly digestive organs um, and in some cases um, other organs as well as a part of uh, hunting for cures. He would actually be celebrated for this. Um, he reported tremendous success rates. Um, he became a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, a celebrity at the time. People began to seek him out for his miracle cures. Um, so many people would actually seek him out that he would leave the hospital for a little while to go into private practice um, before eventually coming back to the hospital. But he developed a worldwide reputation as a leading figure in curing uh, mental illness through this process. Um, and so you can find in his reports a lot of detail um, as he explains himself and pushes this new philosophy. Um, he, he provides a lot of detail about how many people he's treating, how many um, pieces he's removing um, in his searches for cures. Um, he brings in new technology like x-rays. And you can see a, a lot of these in his reports. Um, he talks at length about, and very proudly, about the different types of infection, um, what this infection type did to a person, how removing it cured them. Um, you also find a lot of detail about follow-up reports with people that he had discharged as um, either cured or improved. Um, and what I found by reading these was things that he considered successes, I don't really know if we would consider them successes by today's standards. So example, this is a, a case where he goes into detail about an, an abused woman who came to his care. Um, uh, the treatment she received uh, in the hospital and then um, she's returned home where she continues to face abuse. But the fact that she keeps up her weight shows that she's cured. Um, so his successes are quite questionable. Um, into this picture will step a, a figure that I do want more people to know about. Her name was uh, Dr. Phyllis Greenacre. Um, she was studying at Johns Hopkins under the same mentor that Henry Cotton had studied under. Um, and that mentor 
uh, lament in minor sins, Phyllis to study Cotton's successes. Um, but she finds the opposite. As she's going through the case reports, as she's going through the data, she finds that things do not add up. Um, literally, sometimes the numbers don't add up. Um, she's finding that um, he's underreporting death rates. He is over exaggerating successes. Um, she really highlights how his cures are not actually what they seem to be. Um, however, um, perhaps a big part of it was that she was a woman in a male dominated field at this time. I can't speculate too much on that. Um, but Cotton was very popular in the field. And so her report is not published. Um, it's actually squashed. Um, and one, the only place that I actually know of this report being printed out um, is in a, a self-published book um, by another psychologist named Gilbert Honigfeld. Um, the book's called Dead End. We have a copy of it here in the State Library, um, where he found a copy of her report among the private papers of a former manager of the of the hospital, um, and so he 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 retyped out the, the her report. Um, but this report would have an effect on some of the managers, even though it wasn't published. They would begin to start questioning Cotton a little bit more each year. Um, but as long as he's being celebrated by the profession, um, nothing really changes um, in regard to his his style of care. Um, unfortunately, um, the State Library only has reports for the Trenton Hospital up until 1921, so we are not able to see um, how, how they were reporting on the, um, the end of Cotton's career. He will last up until the 30s, um, so we're un unable to do that here, but what I thought I would do um, is rather than, than focus more on his his style of horror, um, kind of take us back and look at some of the images that we do find in the reports that we have, um, particularly over at Morristown. We do have um, reports that go up through Greystone um, through the 60s, um, but you can start to see um, some of the working spaces and some of the social spaces of these facilities. And so um, you can see this is an example of one of the operating departments that would have been in place. Um, you can see um, down below, this would be considered uh, one of the water treatments they were experimenting with, uh, where actual jets of water um, would be fired at a patient to, um, I believe, relieve muscle stress. Um, so that these are different types of things that they were experimenting with um, on the grounds. You can also see um, that there was a large uh, training school that was built on the grounds um, and that would develop over time. Um, in the earlier reports, you can see levels of detail, including what lectures um, the, the nurses in particular would receive each year, but a training facility would be on these grounds for many years and would continue to grow and grow um, and train a lot of, uh, a lot of future nurses. You can also see examples of patient labor. And one thing that does come across is that patient labor wasn't all farm work, for example. Um, there was, uh, in the top right there, you can see these are patients setting up typesetting for the print shop. Um, there were a number of more white collar type um, uh, shops in, in, the, in the hospitals. And the bottom left, you can see there, um, caning chairs. And so they would actually build the chairs and grow the cane and then cane the chairs. So all in-house with different, uh, different groups of people. Um, and you can find images of the farms and grounds. Um, you can see the, the, the cow barn there. There was a, a patient golf course on the bottom left. Um, on the right, um, this is actually one of the few reports that offered a, uh, a menu uh, what the diet for a patient would look like. Um, I think this one was in response to some accusations that um, patients weren't being fed. So they published what was a typical week. Um, and you can actually go through and you can see week by week uh, what was being offered. Many of these uh, were provided by the farms and grounds um, and then others um, brought in. And you can see a wide variety of, of what they were calling the amusements, um, arts and crafts that were being produced. A lot of the arts and crafts were actually brought to regional shows 
um, uh, and patients could actually bring their, their goods to these regional shows and get some recognition for their work. Uh, patient field days. Um, you can see on the ground, the, the baseball team again with the large grandstand. Um, they built the grandstand um, specifically so that patients could come out and watch games and have just a place to relax. Um, band concerts and things like that. So there, the, the reports themselves, when you look at them individually, you get a lot of hyper detail for a particular year. Um, and you can really get a sense of what was going on in that particular year. But when you look at them as a collection, when you look at them as a whole, you can see how things change over time. You can see how things grow and develop. You can see how individual personalities and administration make very significant changes um, in patient care. So the way I see it is an, an individual report is that detail. The collection as a whole really is a story of a facility. So I do encourage you to take a look at all the reports and kind of get a sense. Um, but again, I do always recommend um, looking for alternate perspectives as well while you're reading. And there are a number of places where you can go for this. Um, memoirs and biographies are not terribly common. And I think part of this is because um, there was, and to an extent still is, uh, a little bit of a stigma around mental illness. Um, so patients themselves and family members may have been, in particular in the past, may have been reluctant to talk about those. Um, but you can find numerous uh, biographies of Dorothea Dix. There are a lot of her writings still available. Um, and the same with Henry Cotton. There are, there are biographies of him as well as a lot of his writings still available. Um, occasionally you can find things from um, some of the more famous patients, for instance. Um, Woody Guthrie uh, was a patient for a while. And there's a book uh, in our collection called The Warty Forty. Um, where a photographer actually went into the abandoned uh, hospital complex and took photos to superimpose over photos um, from the family's private papers and kind of look at his time specifically there and, and what happened to the facilities afterwards. Um, another uh, somewhat famous patient is uh, uh, John Nash, who you might know from the movie A Beautiful Mind. Um, he has spoken in a limited capacity, but he has spoken about his time um, at Trenton. In particular, I emphasize newspaper coverage. Um, the Trenton Times has quite a bit of information, sometimes the New York Times, um, but in particular, I would, I would emphasize looking at local papers. Um, local historical societies may have these um, because uh, I hate to phrase it this way, but a lot of local papers would have a gossip column um, where if nothing else, you might be able to find out um, if someone went to one of the hospitals, maybe why. Um, or if they came back. So these are places where you can find some information. And then of course, there are a lot of other government agency reports. Anytime there was an investigative committee, we might have that. Um, but other tangential agencies like the Department of Health, um, the Department of Water Supply, the Sewerage Commission, all of them may have had a hand in looking at the facilities and, and you can use those to get some more data. Um, so to, to access these collections, and again, these are all um, freely available. Um, you don't need any kind of credential or, or any kind of payment to, to access these collections. They are freely available in our digital library. The main link for our digital library is there on the left. That's the one that says dspace.njstatelib.org. Um, and you can use that to browse to a collection um, and look for um, those and other collections that we have. Or I've also provided some direct links just to get you to the Trenton reports and the Morristown reports that we talked about specifically today. One thing I will let you know about is um, some of these reports were originally digitized using um, uh, older equipment. So if you do find some reports that are still black and white, just know that we are in the process of, of reshooting all of those. Um, so eventually they will all be in these nice um, high res color photos, but many of the many of the reports in the collection are already set in that that style. Um, and so I'd just like to open up for any questions if you have any and also if you don't want to answer ask any questions here in the chat or if we don't have time, please feel free to send me an email with any of your questions and I will get back to you um, with whatever I can. Wonderful. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, there was tons of information. Um, and I personally really enjoyed that. Uh, we do have uh, some questions already. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to find them and read them to you. So our first question is regarding uh, Dr. Cotton's practices. Mm -hmm. Were, since he was, you know, pretty much world renowned and a lot of people were paying attention to him, were his treatments only enacted at Trenton or did they spread over to Morristown? Great question. Um, I would have to double check myself. I would have to go double check and take a look at the reports. I do believe a lot of people were following suit um, because this was something that was um, new and people were considering it a miracle cure. Um, so I'm pretty confident they were, but I would, I can double check that for you. If you want to send me an email, um, also, I can also follow that up directly to you if you'd like. Okay. And uh, somebody else uh, in the chat notes that Greystone also had a magazine called The Psychogram, uh, which yes. highlights life at the hospital. Um, and it gives really great picture of residents' life there. Yes, that's true. And we, we do have many of those. I'm, I'm pretty sure we've, we've, we've digitized at least some of them. Um, they, they should be part of this collection, but we, we do have some at the State Library and it's, it, it is a fascinating collection. Okay. And I have two questions in the Q&A that are about one, patient records and two, somebody who was employed. Um, mm -hmm. and employment records. Would you like me to respond to these or should I let you take the first crack? Oh, please go ahead, Regina, please. Okay, so everybody, the State Library, uh, we're kind of the repository for New Jersey state level documents, published reports. We are not a records repository for these organizations. There are records for these organizations housed at the New Jersey State Archives. Um, and these include private patient records. However, because of New Jersey privacy laws, these records are highly restricted. So it's not like Trenton State Prison where you can just go to the archives and freely look through uh, inmate records. Uh, the state was very concerned with protecting individuals' privacy, uh, and so for that reason, um, you need to reach out to the New Jersey State Archives, uh, which is a separate institution from the State Library, um, and ask what the requirements are to get patient records. So that is question one. Question two um, is about uh, employment records. Um, and again, employment records are kind of hard to come by. Um, in this case, employment records, since the state archives is a repository for records, there may be some there, but I don't know if those were a priority to preserve. So the first place that I would reach out to regarding employment records for individual employees would be the New Jersey State Archives. However, it is very doubtful um, that individual employment records were preserved, unfortunately. So patient records, they will definitely have, although they are very tightly locked down in order to protect, protect individual privacy. And yes, even 100 years ago, there is no expiration of terms. So for patient records, you need to reach out to the archives. For any other type of facility records, you should reach out to the archives as well. Um, So Caitlin, this, this is one that maybe would be in the annual reports, but mm -hmm. it may also fall under patient records as well. Again, mm -hmm. you're looking for patient records, state archives. Mm -hmm. 
My great grandfather was a patient at Greystone from 1895 until his death in 1920. Okay. Do you have any information about how diagnosis and transport to Greystone might have happened? Oh, actually, yes. Um, one of the interesting things was at the end of every report is um, a reprinting of the, the paperwork necessary to transfer a patient. Um, and that's actually interesting because it does change over time according to the rules of the legislature had passed. Um, so there are times when um, it would require two judges signature and two physicians. Then there are times when it'd be just a physician and a judge's signature. Other times when, you know, different variations on that, but you can actually look at the forms that were required to be filled out. So at least you can see the mechanism, the process. Um, a, a lot of patients would come um, because a county would, would be given um, a quota of patients that they could send. And these were typically people who were under um, either county care at the time, and then they could be transferred to the hospital to for the state to resume that care. Um, What's interesting is there are some reports in, um, in there are some reports that that talk about the way patients are coming to them, usually in a way that the director did not like. Um, so, for example, there were some reports where Buttoff complains about um, sheriff's officers showing up with a patient and absolutely no information about the patient um, other than their badge and how that that's grossly inappropriate um, and advocating for some legislative change. Um, there, are other in, there are other reports that talk about um, a, a type of fraud he had found where um, someone would want to send, if, if someone wanted to send a person as a private patient, they would have to pay a certain fee and it was less than what the county would pay to send someone. So the family would work a deal with a local politician to get the person declared um, indigent and under county care sent as part of the county's quota, and then the family would reimburse the county for the lower fee. Um, he points this out as, as fraud that the state needs to step in and, and, and really clamp down on. Um, so you do get a sense from these reports about at least some of the mechanism that comes through. In Buttoff's case, he talks at length about what you shouldn't do um, when sending someone that you needed to be, you needed to talk to them, that it should never be a surprise, that they should not have any mystery about what's about to happen. Um, you don't get that same sense in, in later reports, um, but th there is some discussion about mechanism. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the first part of the question. I think that was it that about, was it. about Oh, diagnosis, diagnosis yeah, and, so, and transportation. So with, so with diagnosis, um, there there is discussion in each report um, about what they what kinds of, of conditions someone would come to them with. And in some reports, it goes into greater detail than others about what that means. Um, but I I tend to recommend there are some medical dictionaries. Um, that are freely available on places like Google Books um, that are printed at the same time period that really go into more a lot more detail on diagnostic criteria. So you can see in a report perhaps um, how someone was classed, um, but then you can go follow up with these dictionaries to actually understand what that might mean. Oh, Caitlin, that's a really great idea using mm -hmm. contemporary medical dictionaries to kind of help mm -hmm. you understand. Yeah, like, and, the, and the Google Book Program has published, has produced a lot of those. So they, they, they can be found freely available online. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, and then um, kind of as a follow up to this, um, in 1895, were there all kinds of ways people were transported to asylums? Like, did they tell you, oh, so-and-so was brought here by wagon or something like that? Well, that's interesting. Uh, there, there are few mentions. Um, yes, I, it, typically by a wagon in the early years. Um, there was actually a train depot that was, um, 
uh, that ran along the property, at least in Trenton, um, and then up through Morristown as well. So for example, when um, the patients were moved from Trenton to Morristown in that first year, they all transported by, by train car. Um, and it actually talks about that at, at length, but um, yeah, so it would be a variety of methods, but it, it sounded to me like the county would send a, a patient over and in those early years more by like a, a horse-drawn wagon, you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, I, I know that the reports contain numerous photographs and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, this might be something that uh, should be checked with the New Jersey State Archives, as mm -hmm. these would be individual records. But are there any um, examples of patient artwork in the annual report, or is there a collection of them that's ever been mm. published? Um, within the reports, I haven't seen patient um, fine art, like, a, like paintings and drawings, um, but there are examples of um, uh, what they actually call fancy sewing. Um, so you can see like some embroidery, um, uh, like there's a there, there's at least one photo that shows um, a lot of patient embroidery brought to um, to a fair to be shown, um, and it, it, you can see kind of a lot of detail in that. There's other photos of um, uh, uh, while they're in the process of rug making, where you can actually see um, some of the designs on the loom, um, but they those are the only ones that I can think of off the top of my head. I, but I, I don't remember ever seeing um, fine artwork. Um, I know that it was produced because it is referenced, but it's not necessarily photographed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And also, um, did Trenton and Morristown each have their own cemeteries? And if yes, are they still maintained and can people visit them? If well, that's a fantastic question. Um, I don't remember ever seeing a cemetery mentioned in, um, in the reports. And there are maps of the grounds um, throughout the reports. I don't remember ever seeing one like a cemetery marked. Um, I'm pretty sure from references in the reports that wherever possible um, a patient would be returned to the family. Um, but obviously that, that might not be the case in every, in every instance, especially with patients who maybe didn't have other family and that was part of why they were there in the first place. Um, my suspicion is that they would have gone to an offsite, um, what we might've called back then a, a pauper cemetery, but that's a speculation. Um, that's a great question though. I'd have to look into that. My only experience is um, there was a county facility um, in, uh, in Secaucus, where um, there was a combined pauper cemetery that would um, be the resting place for people from the asylum, the county asylum, as well as the prison, the tuberculosis hospital, and the, the poorhouse. Um, my suspicion is that something similar would have been set up here, but that, I, I actually don't know. I, all I can say is that it's not, it's not apparent in the reports. And just to add to what you said, Caitlin, um, if you're researching in the uh, vital records era in New Jersey in um, May of 1848 and beyond, a lot of death records do have a place of burial. So if you're researching an individual ancestor, that's a great way to check and confirm where, where they were buried. Yes, and that's and just piggybacking off of what Regina said earlier, if you're not able to get that patient record for an ancestor, you still might be able to get the death record um, and at least get that piece of information. Oh, and also there were some state census um, and some um, veteran schedules in particular um, in state censuses that would list patients who were in the hospitals at the time. Um, so that's also a way to, to at least confirm at least for certain time periods, if an ancestor was was at the hospital. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Thank you for this presentation. It has been a topic I've been dipping into for years and I'm so excited in, to dive into some state reports. Am I poking around in Bergen County at this time? I see a lot of overlap between those needing alms and those needing mental health. 
Correct. two questions. Mm -hmm. One, did Trenton have this kind of overlap between financial and health needs, or did this new facility draw a distinct line? Um, it, it drew a distinct line, but I do put an asterisk on that. Um, it, it wasn't set up to be what, what some of the other places called at the time, either a working house or a poor house. Um, it was designed for persons who were suffering from some kind of either intellectual disability or mental health condition. Um, and that did include um, patients suffering from epilepsy as well up until the, the building of the village for epileptics. But um, so they did try to distinguish in that regard. Am I confident that that was a hard line for them? I'm very skeptical, um, but it was not set out to be the same. Um, and also if you are researching Bergen County, um, I'm not sure your time period, but just so you know, there are a handful of reports, just odd ones. 1891 jumps to my mind um, uh, where the, the managers went and did a much more exhaustive look and you can find in the report their visit to every county facility as well. It's usually something very brief, like two paragraphs, um, but it will give you a, um, a little glimpse into what was going on in Bergen at that time as well. Okay. And then uh, part two of the question, were patients from county institutions sent to Trenton for an advanced level of care? Um, or did they normally stay at county facilities? Um, both things. Um, the, the counties could send patients. Um, they were typically given a quota. Some counties abused that quota and some didn't ever meet their quota. Um, there was a shift after a certain point of time where the counties were just finding it, frankly, cheaper to keep people in county. And so that's where they, they would tend to use their own counties. But um, a lot of patients, usually the maximum that they could send would be sent to the state hospital. Um, and so it, it, particularly in um, the early 20th century, you see directors talking about more and more county patients coming. Um, sometimes it's, it, it's typically in a complaint of a county sending too many or sending patients without any documentation. Um, and they they were trying to fight against that, but you do see them them sending um, patients routinely. Okay, and then finally, I know you mentioned early on, uh, and you showed us kind of a demographic breakdown in one of the early uh, mm -hmm. reports from Trenton. Were patients of different ethnic and racial groups, and do we have a sense whether or not uh, people were treated differently within the asylums? Based and honestly, that? that was something I went in specifically looking for, um, and it does not show up. They, they, they. There are some years where they they talk about heredity and they break it down into um, where a patient was born. Um, and so you'll, you'll see, you know, so many patients from Germany, so many patients from Hungary, so many patients from Ireland, um, but they don't break down ethnicity. Um, so that was something I was actually a little disappointed in. And I was, I was hoping there would be some, some interesting data there. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, at this point, I do not see anything else uh, in chat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close us out. I do want to thank everybody for attending today uh, and for all of your wonderful questions. Today's program is going to be recorded um, and you are going to be getting a follow-up email uh, from me with a link uh, to the program recap and the recording, uh, plus the links that I also shared in chat. Um, and in conclusion, uh, I want to wish everybody a wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Be safe, be well, and we will see you again uh, in our next presentation. And Caitlin, uh, just to close out, you're getting some lovely compliments mm -hmm. in in chat, and and uh, and with that, I'm going to close us out. Have a great afternoon, everybody.